What is up, Generals? We are back with Ultimate General Civil War. We're playing the Union Major General Campaign on the March to Richmond. We're going to go ahead and jump in to, where is it? Georgia Railroad, the defensive battle that is the very last battle in the campaign. We're going to go ahead and send Grant with the third corps. Again, the idea is uh, I want Grant's third star uh, going into Richmond. And frankly, if I'm not going to get it here, I'm pretty much not going to get it. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Departed Chattanooga in Tennessee. Continued south during our advance. Confronted by Joe Johnston. Continuously excluded without giving me a battle. That's clever. That's clever. Confederate forces withdrew. Blah, 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 blah. One of our corps needed east, according to our latest reports. Hood has replaced Johnston. Uh, Hood is known to be an aggressive commander. That's accurate. So all of our forces have been warned of a possible Confederate attack. Based on this, it appears that we are outnumbered 2 to 1, which is rough. Comma, however, this is a defensive battle. All we got to do is hold terrain. Scouts report that a Confederate force is heading towards our trenches. Hmm, interesting. We need to deploy our men or repel the attackers or hold your position or else the Confederates will be able to reopen the Georgia Railroad and receive valuable supplies. All right, so Grant's Third Corps. Um, jokingly, my, uh, you know, my Siege Corps is uh, being tasked with the battle here. Um, and this is basically it. So uh, there's a kind of an initial thought of possibly what if I occupy this terrain, but the thought process now is I think if I've got dudes here in the trenches, they'll be able to shoot anybody who would be in this forest um, and anybody on the way to it. And I'm not mistaken, I think the attack comes generally from this direction. Um, this makes me nervous here. So yeah, I got guys in those trenches or whatever, maybe even theoretically along this position. Actually, this isn't a terrible place to, well, no, because they'll be able to still shoot from here to that place. Um, hmm. Same deal here though, although crossfire, so that's not that bad. No safe way to attack the front. I'm okay with that. That's fine. Hmm. So ballparking it, it looks like this is going to be where the lion's share of like the really hard fighting is going to be. This probably won't be too terribly difficult to hold, and then we should have some fun, so to speak, over there. All right, let's just jump in. Mm -hmm. So I had um, audio that I'd recorded uh, during play, or I recorded the audio live, and it just... From a commentary perspective, this isn't a terribly exciting episode. So instead, um, I'm going to <clears throat> uh, comment over it um, because uh, on my last video, I want to shout out to God Slayer 18. Um, there were a number of really great questions that got asked, um, and it God Slayer has seven um, tips that someone's given him. Um, or her, and they want to see if, uh, you know, what my thoughts on some of these things are. So first of all, that's wonderful. Thanks very much for asking the questions. Um, I, uh, it's me on here rambling <laughs> as I go on and on and on, um, about, uh, you know, ultimate general. Um, and if I have something to kind of keep me structured, that's probably going to be better, <laughs> better for all of us. Um, so the, and then I'll get to something else about, he asked about, they asked about when the next uh, Confederate, um, when the Confederate campaign would kick back up. So in short, after I finish the Battle of Richmond, I want to take a couple of days and then I'll jump back in with the CSA. I, I, I love this, this game and it's, you know, undeniably it's the lion's share of my channel. So clearly I'd be a fool to, uh, to uh, turn away from it, you know, too early. So uh, let's get to uh, God Slayer's tips. Um, first one reads, don't charge. Charging is, ineffect is inefficient since you're using up condition regardless of the success of attack. You're leaving your men susceptible to fire from a plethora of enemies that they'd be out of range of otherwise. So this is, I think, generally good advice uh, with the exception. That, so I'm pretty much going to say it depends to pretty much all of these. Um, 
There are times when charging is good, uh, especially with um, cavalry, pretty much of either variation. Um, I, I, I agree with the concept that by and large, charging infantry is typically a mistake because it's 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 um, you can kind of do it where you do it sort of the the way that the the Swedes did in the Seven Years War, where kind of or the Great Northern War. My apologies. Um, you they walk they walk until they're just right there, and then you launch your dudes forward. Um, but the AI, like you're seeing kind of in the video right now, the AI tends to rush for no reason really um when they're out of musket range or canister range and and they run in because they i don't know that they want to close the gap or something but there's no gap to close if you're outside of musket range it doesn't matter and if you're outside of like efficient musket range it really still doesn't matter yeah you'll take you know 10 15 losses from a from a from a volley but 10 or 15 losses from a volley of 2000 men who cares sorry to those 10 or 15 men but like really who cares Casualties are inevitable in this game, you know, in the thousands. I, I will, I would wager a guess that I've probably suffered upwards of, upwards of, I don't know, 50,000, 80,000 casualties, somewhere in there. We'll find out when I finish Richmond, but I'm sure it's going to be messy. The butcher's bill is going to be nuts. Now, the thing is, is the Confederate butcher's bill is going to be 10 times, not 10 times, like five times. Um, so charging... As the first means of attack, I would say is a mistake. If you've got a unit whittled down to the point where it's on the edge and you've got it surrounded and you've got it pinned in the corner of the map or whatever, yeah. In those situations where you're can, where you pretty sure you can get a unit to surrender, for sure charge. Um, if you've got a battery of artillery um, <clears throat> and you've got your typical skirmisher swarm kind of hitting it, send one in, charge one unit of skirmishers in to tie it up because when they're on that edge of morale or even when they're in melee, they're typically not going to be able to shoot and your skirmishers can pelt it. Um, well, actually, I'd send two and that's another thing. Don't, if you're going to charge, don't charge one-on-one. -on -one. Always, 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 always try and overwhelm like a two-to-one, three-to-one, whatever. Um, with it's, it's Panda Crowd's cup brought it up in his videos, and then Compass has brought it up in his videos. I'm sure uh, Spectrum and Asius have brought it up in their videos as well. There is some kind of a debuff that affects the morale of the unit when they're being attacked two to one, or uh, maybe the the offensive output is basically just divided across both units or something, so that both units that charge are better off than the one being charged. That's why you see me running my cavalry all the time in a big brute squad of like three because I can spread the casualties out, but they're all going to be able to kill at the same level of efficacy, and it just shatters the morale bar. So if you're going to charge, two or more units charging is what you need to be doing. And that can include even just the detached skirmishers of the brigade charging that unit as well. That sounds silly, but that's the way the morale works as far as the engine's concerned. Um, and it's maybe a bit unrealistic to think that, that the additional, like, Oh no, Jeb, <laughs> like 118 guys split off from those 2000 and they're hitting us on the flank. Like, I don't know. It's a game. You know, you play the rules that the game puts in front of you. So charging is usually a mistake, but in some circumstances where you're pretty sure you can do it, um, where you're going to limit the damage you take, but you're going to outdo, you're going to out damage the enemy for what you take as a result. It can be useful. That shock and aggression, um, it's it's the hallmark of, I think, my play style. Like, if, if you want careful, steady play, there's simply no one better who does it, in my opinion, than something Compass. He's, he's, his play style is so methodical and so machine-like that if I was playing against, you know, if I was the Confederate Army going up against him in his major general campaign, I'd pretty much just throw in the towel. You know, I just, it's, there's no point. My play style is a lot more aggressive and utilizes a lot more shock. And my men sometimes pay for it, but I'm really happy with the kill ratios I'm getting. Um, utilization, utilizing Panic Routes mod, these big units of theirs, they're not suffering any kind of efficiency penalty as a result of their size. So, um, you, you know, it's a lethal game and you need to, you need to 
seize that momentum, seize the initiative and utilize it. So I'm always looking to try and push that initiative in my favor. So we're talking a long time about point number one. Um, point number two, keep moving your batteries up so they are right behind your infantry when attacking. Too often they are way back shooting solid shot when they could be shooting, doing counter battery damage or using shell on enemy infantry. 100% completely agree. This is a fantastic point. Um, it's the difference, I think, between uh, good aggressive play and bad aggressive play is depending on the kind of battery. And again, it depends. Depending on the kind of battery, having it right up on the ass of your infantry is simply the single most effective thing you can do with artillery. And in that category, I do talk about it a little bit in this video, 12-pound Napoleons, the 12-pound howitzer, as much as I shit on that gun, and justifiably so in my opinion, um, the uh, to a lesser degree, the James... Um, and, uh, the six pound, obviously the 1841, six pound, uh, rifle cannon, and the Napoleon, um, basically anything smooth bore, howitzers, 24 pound howitzers, obviously you want them on the ass of your infantry, pretty much the entire battle. And you want to be losing a cannon here and a cannon there. If those units aren't taking casualties, you're not being aggressive enough with them. And again, this is my personal play style. I'm, I'm, I'm an aggressive commander. Um, and I like it that way. That's just the way I like to play. Um, <clears throat> aggression with short range artillery or even medium range artillery. Like, like if you're going to be shoehorned into using three or three inch ordnance guns or, um, Tredegers, or again, the James, the James is like one of these amazing Jack of all trades, master of none cannons that I've fallen in love with as being like, I can put the James literally anywhere and it'll do good work. Like that's fantastic. I can't put a parrot on the ass of my infantry and I can't ask a 24 pound howitzer gun to do counter battery work. I can ask a James to do either one of those things and it'll be like, yep, sounds good. Uh, <laughs> so, um, you got to think about what your batteries, like what their composition is and how they're being used. So some of them you want on your ass and some of them you want in the back doing long range. Something compass swears by the Whitworth for the like king of ultimate long range counter battery work. And I, it, it's probably true. It's probably true. You know, he's never steered me wrong. He's never been incorrect about these kind of things. So I'm sure he's right that the Whitworth is an excellent gun for that particular use. My personal play experience has not been fantastic with the Whitworth, so I shit on it all, all the time. And it's probably, you know, not deserved. Um, so let's move along. Um, don't use melee. Oh, sorry. With artillery, the 10 pound parrot. I talked about it in my um, artillery video, which is like 30, 31, something like that. Um, and I was, I think, unjustifiably not a fan of it. I think it's a fantastic counter battery piece. It's got one of the best damage curves for long range use in the game. And especially in terms of being available. I mean, the gold standard is of course a 20 pound parrot, but, um, the 10 pound parrot gets the job done and is effective at cost as well. So now point number three, don't use melee cavalry beyond uh, first bolt run. They're economically inefficient, blah, 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 blah. If you want to read the actual direct text, it's in, um, it's the top comment as of the time of this recording um, for episode 36, Harrison's Creek. So actually I think the artillery episode might've been like 23, 25. Um, <clears throat> strong disagree. Strongly disagree. Uh, melee cavalry is absolutely a glass cannon. You definitely need to be careful with it. Um, and I will, I will counter that strong disagreement by saying that carbine cav is another excellent jack of all trades you can ask carbine cav to do melee and they will do it efficiently you can ask carbine cav to dismount and fight as either dismounted infantry or skirmishers or flankers or you name it and they'll do the job uh, especially with the pattern 1861 enfield musket or sorry carbine that shoots to range 300 which is the same range as rifled muskets for the infantry the 61 enfield Let's dismounted cavalry seriously threaten and operate as, or as light infantry, dismounted infantry. So it's, I, I, I don't shit on carbine cav or as I call them dragoons in a very Napoleonic kind of way. They're excellent, but I strongly disagree with the notion that melee cavalry is ineffective beyond um, first bull run. Frankly, it is the best way to clear some objectives or trenches and um they're cheap to level like to continue um not level but uh reinforce and <clears throat> you can use the you know, the shitty flintlock pistol until the end of the game and they're fine um now don't use them alone i talked about this with them point number one brute squad them one melee cav one carbine cav is an excellent pair of brigades that will do wonderful 
Uh, point number the fourth, attack in solid line and all at once. Uh, now there's some points here about the Chancellorsville video that are likely probably God Slayer's videos because I, I think that they don't apply to what happened in my game because I fought very defensively. Um, <clears throat> again, it depends. Broadly, I would say that that's generally true. Attacking um, in a solid line and all at once is usually good because you can overwhelm if you have numeric superiority, you can overwhelm whatever exists in the defender's um, in the defender's position, comma. However, um, oftentimes attacking in a general general broad uh, front, the general attack a la the First World War, would be a gigantic mistake. Um, so take a look at, uh, for example, the video that this comment is on Harrison's Creek. <clears throat> If you launch a general attack across the line, you're going to lose 10,000, 20,000 men. You're going to lose just huge swarms of dudes for no for no gain. Um, don't do that. Find a weak point, a salient, or a flank that's not being covered, or the edge of the map because it's a video game and <laughs> maps have edges, and, and pierce there and crush them. Find your opening and then force that opening open. Um, so I would say no. Defend in a defend in a wide front, but when you attack, attack in a tight, narrow corridor, um, and then be sure to have follow-on troops to make sure that the the point that you pierce, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the point that you pierce is then forced wider open so that you can affect a breakthrough. Um, so with four, I would say that that's generally a mistake attacking in a solid line. Um, it depends on kind of the tactical situation on the ground, but broadly speaking, I think it's better to attack on a narrow front. If it's a defensive battle, attack on a narrow front, pierce, and then force a breakthrough via flanking. If it's uh, an open field battle, honestly, fall back until you get in a better territory. You should never be fighting open field battles if you can avoid it. Um, so there's that. Point the fifth, uh, the person says, pause, all caps, and get all your units involved. Totally agree. Totally agree. When I'm recording videos, I tend to play on slow-mo um, because I want the same effect of being able to get all my dudes involved and everything like that, but I don't want to have you guys watch me pause the game and just like freak out or, or click click around for a little while. Um, I generally also like playing in slow-mo when it's just me um, because when you pause, you can't watch like and see if what you're suggesting your guys do is effective. Um and so if you play in slow-mo, instead of having to uh, give the commands, watch for a second, pause, give the commands, watch for a second, pause, you can you can just play, play the game. Yeah, it moves slower. Okay, fine. That's, you know, a thing. But you can just play and see how it shakes out. Um, okay, point the six, ignore auto-scaling and just focus on your own army. Um, this, again, seems like it's highly specific to Godslayer's uh, content or videos that he's posted. Um, I think that's probably okay. That's an it depends kind of thing. That's a your playstyle kind of thing. Um, I've probably triggered scaling a couple of times in my videos and it's never really, never really been a major issue. Um, I know for sure I probably scaled it at, at my version of Chancellorsville because my army was... 1400 at the time and there were uh like 2950 sized confederate brigades in that particular fight so yeah probably scaling was a problem for me there um but by and large if you're not being an idiot about how you grow your army i'm pretty sure like unless you're building like 2000 man brigades before shiloh and stuff um and even then because the ai screws you at shiloh but it gains mill and malvern it'll end up being a problem um you can probably scale to like 1300, uh, 1400, 1500, 1600 throughout the entire game, the whole game, and and have very minimal effect from the scaling. I I understand like managing scaling as a problem and managing it is kind of a thing that can pay pay dividends, but I've not really ever seen it be a major issue. And maybe it's because this army's like it's big, but it's not huge that I've not triggered scaling in any kind of major way. So this is a personal play experience, but I. I would say be careful with that. Um, but yeah, so, and then there's a couple points uh, with point six that I do agree. You need to cycle in new units to get them experience. Replacing these men are cheaper than replacing your two-star veterans. The ideal army has many infantry brigades that are just above the two-star level, but not much higher. Um, uh, ideal, I don't know if I'd say ideal, uh, but that's certainly a strategy that works. Um, and that's an excellent compromise of mass versus quantity. 
uh, where you keep your army at a, to the point where they're going to fight above their weight class, but you're not paying out the ass to keep three star veterans, you know, um, at fighting strength. Uh, because the second you start doing what I try to do, like my favorite thing to do is just grow the army organically and stick recruits in there and see what happens. Um, I think it's a very realistic way to do it. I think it's a, it, 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 for me, like it's a nice role play thing. Like, you know, I, I name my units and I, I give units guard signifiers and whatnot. Like I like that story element. Um, it's important that if I can try and figure out what, what brigade of mine used to be first infantry comma, if they're still here um, or any of the units that were at Philippi, any infantry, like I'm going to see if I can't get that infantry brigade to the point where they capture the flag in Richmond. Cause it's just sort of like, it's appropriate. Right. So the role play thing is, is important to me as a player, but I don't know if it's important to, everybody as a player and i wouldn't i wouldn't say that it should be or, or shouldn't be um so yeah uh and then the last point that i want to touch on here is the 20 pound parrots are a class of their own regarding counter battery work don't waste them on enemy inf- enemy infantry target the artillery for great effect uh that's point the seventh and that is one that i completely agree with uh and then as an extension of that point and additionally part of point point two know what your batteries are supposed to be doing. Um, so it's important to keep an eye on kind of what you want your guns doing and what you, like what the mission is for them. I talk about it a lot in my videos. You need to know, like, is it counter battery? Is it counter infantry? Is it a general purpose gun? You got to have a mission in mind for your guns. 20 pound parrots are indeed a class of their own when it comes to counter battery work, uh, but they're also good for killing commanders. They're also good for finishing off units that have routed that are at a weak size. Um, so I don't, I wouldn't say like get blinders on and just have them shoot at guns. They're good at that. They're really good at that, but there are other uses for that excellent long range work that they can do beyond just shooting cannons. Um, so that's, yeah. Uh, we're wrapping up in terms of the gameplay portion of, Georgia Creek, I think, whatever this battle is called, the one where you defend the thing. Um, broadly speaking, I held the line and then tried to flank left. It, it did not go great. I spent a little more lives than I would have liked to, but I did take out three units of artillery and I think one unit of cavalry. So it's not, not a complete like loss or anything. And it cost me, you know, I don't know, 150 some cavalry guys or something. So all things considered, that wasn't that bad. Um, the play on the battle. And then, uh, all of all of that went pretty well. Um, so, um, broadly speaking, with this particular fight, hang out in the trenches. The end. Um, so we do before medicine. We do forty five hundred. Call it with everything else. Call it forty seven hundred. Um, and they do. I don't know. I saw like thirty thousand. I thought uh, maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong. Uh, we lose two officers wounded who likely will not recover before Richmond, which is a shame, uh, but I've got plenty of generals sitting around and I can buy some if I need to. We capture not a lot, enough Richmonds that I can probably up upgrade a brigade to them, um, which will be, you know, fun. And then Fayetteville's, which is a good weapon, but it's basically just money at this point, and that's more or less it. So let's talk about... Um, this channel, this series, whatever. We're going into the Battle of Richmond in the next video. There's, um, I'm going to put the last point here into politics because I've got nothing else to do with it. Army Org 10 does me no good, um, and I don't have enough points to put into recon to make it worth my time. Um, and, and frankly, I don't know that high levels of recon is really even all that useful. So, um, yeah. That's that's basically it. We're going to do Richmond, and then we're going to see what the ending holds. Uh, I don't know if it's static based on Major General, or if it's static based on your politics score or what. Um, you know, we'll figure it out. But I watched uh, Something Compass, and he was president, um, <laughs> and then made this great line, like, why anybody would want to be president? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, he's not wrong, especially in a Reconstruction era uh, United States. So, um, I talked about it briefly, but I'm going to jump into the major general Confederate campaign, uh, after Richmond and the thought that I am having, and I want to know your, your, your considerations or your thoughts. And if you made it this far, awesome. Um, 
I want to know what the what you guys think, but uh, my inclination is to play the major general Confederate campaign in um, the JNP rebalance mod as exists on the game labs forums. Uh, so there's, there's the base game, which is basically what you're seeing here, more or less. Um, this is essentially vanilla ultimate general. Um, with a minor change in terms of the scaling effect. Um, and then the rebalance mod, um, pretty significantly changes a lot of, of things within how perks work and how, like what guns you have access to. And, and to be frank, I played it a little bit over Christmas. Uh, I took my laptop home. My laptop's not what I record on. Um, and like basically any laptop can run this game. Right. So <laughs> I went and I downloaded the, the rebalance mod cause I was, I want to know kind of like what's up. I only played, uh, the Confederate tutorial mission. Um, and even in that battle, I was impressed with the change to the pacing, the change to the feel of units. Um, and I would be very interested to start playing a rebalance mod campaign. However, I've already started a major general um, UI AI campaign. So the reason that I'm thinking about abandoning it and jumping over to the rebal mod is that Panda Kraut is right now doing a major general or possibly even legendary uh, confederate campaign. And and that dude's got like this, an encyclopedic knowledge of the missions for the confederate campaign. I don't know if I can do better. I don't, and that's not, it's not an issue of like trying to do better in a competitive campaign or competitive thing, but I don't know how much value there is in just parroting everything he does. And then not like, the same tactics or whatever, uh, the same army composition strategy, but he's doing the series like as I speak. You know, he had an episode earlier today, I think. Um, so, in in the interest of trying to do something different or trying to shake it up, so to speak, um, it's it's my inclination, <clears throat> excuse me, to start the campaign over again before I get too far on the Confederate side. Cause I'm, I'm five battles in. it's not a big deal. Um, start the campaign over again and play fresh basically through the J and P rebalance mod, which I will, uh, I'll be discovering it basically with you guys. I, I've played, you know, one battle at uh, brigadier general on the Confederate side and that's it. That's the beginning and the end of my play experience of the rebalance mod. Um, so I'd be very interested to try that out. So if that's something you'd be interested or like to see, um, let me know if you're like really adamant that I stick with the base game and play the Confederate campaign. Let me know. Um, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Uh, in terms of what's happening on screen, I'm selling off a bunch of weapons. I know I'm not going to use before now. And, uh, Richmond, and then I'm talking about, I'm kind of updating my opinion about artillery. So I, I did record audio through all of this, and it's just not, it's not my best stuff. It's not good work. So in, in instead of kind of just recording the video and uploading it and calling it a day, I'm going to do this, and we've got a couple more minutes to kill. Um, so up until Richmond, I'm going to kind of give my postmortem on the Union campaign. Um and we'll talk a little bit more about the same subjects in in Richmond, and then it'll be an appropriate conclusion and all that kind of thing. Um, I really enjoyed this. I really enjoyed the Union campaign. I really enjoyed Major General. Um, you know, at, at BG, I'd kind of thought like, oh, I've kind of solved Ultimate General. I had a solution for every map. I had a solution for the game. You know, my infantry at that point was at 1750 or 1800 before I, I like, I didn't know about the scaling thing, but I just kind of naturally landed on about that number because I was like, oh, bigger than this doesn't seem to do much better. Um, so yeah, like now I know I'd pushed to get my infantry to 15 in this campaign, but experience and everything else is just kind of naturally nudging me back down to 1400. And 14 seems like a nice round number. 14 seems to be, you know, um, enough. Uh, looks like Grant didn't get a third star. 14 seems to be like enough that they can do 
they can stick it out and fight for a while, but they're small enough and like maneuverable enough that they can move around. Um, the Union infantry is absolutely up to the task that this game puts in front of them. Um, comma, they are not up to it alone. You you have to support blueback infantry with above average officers, you know, um, overlapping fields of fire, uh, excellent rifles, excellent muskets. You need a lot of artillery. Like you need to lean into the advantages of the union, which is to say numbers and artillery, um, and industry. You need to lean heavily on those things because the basic blueback infantry can and will fight the Confederate to a standstill. But, but um, on a man-for-man ratio, the statistically speaking, until you get to this point in the campaign when you've just got enough experience, you know, look at the stat lines of some of these units that have been around for a while. Like at, the, at this point in time in the campaign, like they're they are the absolute equal of anybody you'd put them up against. And you know, John Keegan, in his history of the American Civil War, says that by 1865, um, either army, but to to either army, but to be sure the Union Army was the equivalent of any major Western military in the world at the time. And I I would argue he's correct. I would argue that he's 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 got it in terms of their ability to entrench, in terms of their ability to keep on the move, in terms of their ability to um produce artillery quickly and entrench and, and get into position and skirmish properly and um, the increasing utilization of light infantry in front of a block of heavy infantry to kind of finalize things out or finish things out, logistics, weapons, um, leadership, organization from the low-level NCOs who kind of make you know where the metal meets the meat all the way up to senior command staff, all of the weak and quibbling and political generals had been drummed out of the army by a relentless um, cycle of you either are good or you're fired from from Lincoln uh, all the way through the end of the war. What was left was a, I mean, a lean, mean fighting machine, right? A good, a, a well-led, well-supplied, well-equipped, well-trained army that had jettisoned anything that didn't work and was left with the things that did. Um, so, yeah. And, and, in, and in, in terms of tactic strategy and everything else, I would argue the Confederates weren't terribly far behind. They were inarguably lacking in terms of their industrial capacity. There's no denying that. There's... You know, increasingly as Sherman destroyed um, the ability of the Confederate States of America to produce clothing, let alone food, let alone cannons or sabers or pistols or rifles, just clothing, you know, um, or basic medical supplies. There's a point where the CSA stopped functionally being a modern nation. And at that point in time, they were little better than an insurgency trying to hold off, you know, basically the inevitable. There was a field army, you know, up until Appomattox Courthouse, there was a field army, but increasingly, even if they knew what they were doing and even if they had a solid handle on how to fight and how to maneuver and how to all those things, more and more and more as, you know, the writing was on the wall, they're, their soldiers, their experienced soldiers who weren't diehards and could find a way out were, were deserting in large numbers. And, and by that point in time, the institutional knowledge of how to be an army at the modern level of warfare in that era probably started to fall away. But at their height, at Chancellorsville, at Second Bull Run, at, you know, um, even Gettysburg, the Confederate army was also, I would argue, the equal of any Western army, any Western military in capacity, or sorry, capability, if not capacity. They may have lacked the ability to produce enough artillery. They certainly lacked the ability to project force beyond the borders of the Confederacy. They didn't have a big enough navy. They didn't have, you know, they didn't have a Marine Corps to speak of. They wouldn't have been able to land troops at 
um, Tripoli, for example, the famous Marine action that's part of you know, the song. Um, they wouldn't have been able to partake in a military action in Europe if France had tried to ask them. Let's say that France had backed the Confederacy and they were like, hey, help us in the Franco-Prussian War after the Civil War ended. Like, the CSA wouldn't have been able to do anything. So from a lot of those levels in terms of force projection, in terms of anything else, they didn't have the capacity to help. But in terms of know-how, inarguably, I think they knew what they were doing. Um, and then we're wrapping up here. So in the next battle, Richmond, it's going to be great. Um, hope you guys have a great one. This is Fiasco signing out.